having pets if you're not allergic, like I have a dog and I call him my microbiome reconstitution assistant uh, because he licks my face, he licks my hands all the time and he's spreading his microbiome on us but that keeps our microbiome varied and diverse. Patients that had received different types of antibiotics had an alteration in their gut flora that could last anywhere from four months to 12 months. One of them was clindamycin and they found that the microbiome was shifted for four months. For Cipro, it actually lasted for 12 months and just think how many people get Cipro prescriptions so common for UTIs for any sort of gastroenteritis. Uh, Cipro with Flagyl is, is uh, you know, probably the preferred antibiotic combo for gastroenterologists. Hey folks, Mike Mutzel here with HighIntensityHealth.com. Thanks for tuning back in to episode number 124. Now, before we dive into the show with Dr. Vincent Pedro, I just want to let you know about his book called Happy Gut. Now, I would encourage you to check this out. I've edited it, I've read it, I've interviewed him now twice, uh, and it's loaded with great information. And here's why I think it's, you know, this interview is particularly uh, very important for you. And also the book is important. You know, a lot of people are talking about the diet, and we talk about this on the show a lot, how, you know, the things that we eat, the food that we eat or we don't eat, how that affects the gut microbiome. And that's really important. Now, we're going to talk about food a little bit in the show, but also important are the thoughts, the repetitive negative self chatter, you know, uh, meditating versus not meditating, being stressful, uh, sleep, and also uh, not only the toxic thoughts, but also toxic chemicals that you're exposed to through your air, food, and water and how that affects gut health and particularly uh, the health of the gut microbiome. And so we're gonna learn more about air filters, about uh, ways to meditate, why you should meditate, how to meditate. Uh, we're gonna talk about heart math and we're also gonna talk about pets and how household pets can introduce healthy uh, bacteria, improve bacterial diversity, maybe even some parasites that may be helpful for you and also soil microorganisms, how to get soil into your food via a healthy manner. So we, we cover the gamut. Uh, you're gonna love the show. This was filmed on site in this clinic in Manhattan. Uh, that's why I look a little rough, by the way, around the edges. I have a little uh, little extra uh, facial hair. My hair's a little messy and stuff like that uh, during this interview because my luggage got lost in, in the, the transportation from uh, uh, Seattle to Manhattan. So just so you know, that's, that's kind of what's going on there. I'm not going rogue on it. Now, I know you're going to want to check out the show notes. We took excellent show notes for you. You can find those by going to highintensityhealth.com slash grpedre. You can also learn more about his book there. Click through the links there. Again, this will be available worldwide on, on December 29th, 2015 and you can help support the show by clicking through those links and we have a great lineup in 2016 we're now traveling doing on-site interviews uh, doing still some Google Hangouts but mostly on-site we want to uh, kind of get that that benefit of the energy and the, the live uh, interview format we think that's uh, really important for people so again thanks for tuning in and sharing a moment of your day with us let's dive in the show with Dr. Vincent Pedre all right well Dr. Vincent Pedre we're here to talk about your new book and learn some cutting-edge insights about the gut so there's many points that I want to bring out in this conversation, uh, but the first and foremost would be some of the new research that has emerged about the microbiome. And maybe you could start off with this, the story that you were sharing with me about your journey to the Natural History Museum yesterday and all the education about the microbiome. This uh, is amazing uh, that they have this special exhibit. It'll be on till sometime next year. And it's called The Secret World Inside of Us. And it's perfect for both children and adults. Uh, but you learn some really fascinating facts, not everything I knew. I, like yesterday, I learned that there could be up to 150 different species of bacteria just in our palms. And that most of them on the skin live in the creases where it's a little mo moisture and that the areas in between are actually more barren and don't have that many bacteria. Interesting. Um, and they had also, you know, a lot of stuff that we know, like how the microbiome transfers to the newborn infant through the vaginal canal. And they talked about how uh, infants that are born through C-section don't get the benefit of that. But we're seeing more and more doctors use a vaginal swab on those infants so they can get the benefit of their, their mother's vaginal microbiome, which is so key for their, their health. Uh, but also how during breastfeeding, uh, the child actually gets the bacteria from the mom's gut through the breast milk. So they had some really, like they were very up to date with a lot of the information they had there. I was impressed. That's really exciting. And, and they also had some interactive games for kids. So they made it kind of fun to learn about the microbiome. They had a whole person on a table and you could touch different parts and learn about the microbiome on the skin or in the gut. So we know that you know, we mostly talk about 
the microbiome inside our guts, but we have multiple different microbiomes and they vary depending on the conditions upon which they live. So the microbiome on the skin is probably going to be more aerobic bacteria that use oxygen. A microbiome inside our gut, especially the large intestine, is going to be mostly anaerobic bacteria, bacteria that don't use oxygen. So there's different adapted microbiomes for each part of the body. And the cool thing is how we're learning how this microbiome interacts with us and how it creates health and how an imbalance in the microbiome is what uh, creates a lot of disease. And part of the exhibit was about how um, an experiment in mice and they were looking at mice that had were more risk takers so and they measured it by going to the edge of a platform and jumping off and there was another group of mice that hesitated a bit so they were i guess more anxious they they used that as an anxiety model right and when they transferred the bacteria from the mice that were bolder more courageous to the more anxious mice that were more cautious the anxious mice took on the behavior of the bolder mice and it, so it shortened the time that it would take. So it's so fascinating, you know, we're not there with humans yet, we don't completely understand it, but we are seeing in animal studies that the microbiome can even control the way that our minds work. It's really fascinating and it brings up a lot of different points of like maybe what I want to pull from you, where medicine is going you know, from poop pills to antibiotics. I think we're going to an era that is going to have very directed probiotics for specific conditions. Like today I saw a study using lactobacillus uh, curvatus and plantarum and on patients with high triglycerides. And they, it was a double blind placebo controlled study and the people were matched by um, level of exercise, diet, all that was the same. The difference was one group got the probiotic, the other group didn't. And the group that got the probiotic had an 18.1%, I think, drop in their triglycerides, but they also showed an increase in their LDL particle size. And this was all only with a, with a probiotic. So I think we're going into an era where we're going to analyze and see a probiotic that's specifically for patients with eczema, probiotics that are for preventing antibiotic associated diarrhea. And we're not doing this in the US yet, but I was very impressed. I had a patient that um, has family in Switzerland and she ended up having to go to urgent care there and was placed on an antibiotic and at the same time, she was prescribed a probiotic to counter the effects of the antibiotic. Just think about that. Like how advanced that is that they already have that as a prescription, a proven probiotic strain that will protect the patient from the consequences of, of uh, basically decimating the microbiome in their gut as a result of antibiotics. And that, tie, that ties into the other research we were talking about, which is uh, the study that came out on antibiotics and their effect on the microbiome long term. So patients that had received different types of antibiotics had an alteration in their gut flora that could last anywhere from four months to 12 months. And the, the other, the weird thing in the study was how the mouth, they also swabbed the mouth, the saliva, so the mouth microbiome actually reconstituted itself within one week, but the gut microbiome was affected for months after. And they think probably because the, the contact time with the mouth is so little that probably very little of the antibiotic. Um, Got in there and could damage yeah. and so, yeah. Yeah, exactly. But obviously when we throw an antibiotic into the gut, we are causing some major downstream problems. I think, and the medicine of the future is going to think about that. And you will not only be prescribing an antibiotic for a patient, you will be prescribing the microbiome reconstitution plan for that patient. And that was some, one thing I also, I was impressed with this exhibit at the Natural History Museum because they had a game for kids 
And one of the parts in the game was you had to give someone an antibiotic and then it showed you how you, you lost a big portion of your microbiome and then it said, well, next step, what would you do? And one of the choices was give them a probiotic to reconstitute mm -hmm. the microbiome. And we know that's not the only way to help our microbiomes. We can talk about that too. Yeah, like, I wanna definitely want to dive all, into all the different yeah. ways that we can reconstitute the microbiome and keep a, a varied and healthy gut flora. Right. Yeah, I want to talk about that. Let, let's finish up the probiotic antibiotic discussion because I like that you give Switzerland, I believe, credit, right? That That's very progressive, but functional medicine practitioners such as yourself being certified have been doing this for a very long yes. time. If you're on antibiotics, well, of course, you take Saccharomyces blurry, the probiotic yeast, because yes. that's not affected by that antibiotic. Or you take a uh, probiotic. You, you take a around. probiotic. Um, a lot of times I'll, I'll put the patient on the probiotic while they're on the antibiotic but dosed at a different time. So if it's a twice a day antibiotic, then the probiotic is in the middle of the day. And then once they're off the antibiotic, then I might increase the dose of the probiotic for a short period, maybe do twice a day, and then bring them back down to a maintenance dose. And of course, while encouraging them to do all the other things that help keep a varied and robust microbiome. Right, right. And another thing that we were talking about is different antibiotics affect the microbiome differently. So I think you had Cipro and there was Metronine, was all, I can't remember. So Yeah, so one of them was clindamycin and they found that the microbiome was shifted for four months. For Cipro, it actually lasted for 12 months. And just think how many people get Cipro prescriptions, so common for UTIs, for any sort of gastroenteritis, uh, Cipro with Flagyl is, is uh, you know, probably the preferred antibiotic combo for gastroenterologists. And, uh, and also, as we know, for gonorrhea, but it was so overused that we developed resistance to Cipro and the CDC recommends against using Cipro for gonorrhea. Now, I mean, we're, we're down to having to give an, um, an antibiotic injection uh, to treat patients with gonorrhea. And that was the other thing they talked about was how many, uh, you know, so because of the use of antibiotics in the U.S., two million people each year develop an antibiotic resistant infection. And out of those, 23,000 people die. Wow. So, and, and the most common ones, as we know, are C. diff. That has become rampant. It's resistant to both flagell and even vancomycin. So, and resolved with a fecal transplant within 48 hours, which is pretty amazing, you know, that the, something that cannot be treated with an antibiotic can actually be cured with a fecal transplant. And then we have CRE, which is uh, carbapenem resistant um, enterobacter, I believe. And uh, the third one was Neisseria gonorrhea. Wow. So these are among the most resistant cases. And we've bred them because the whole approach in medicine has been to attack the microbiome without having respect for the fact that there is a portion of the microbiome which is friendly for us. You know, it's meant there, it's, it's there for a reason. It's meant to promote our health as well. Right, yeah, it's almost, you know, Marco Ruggiero is a Italian trained MD, PhD, and we interviewed him for the autism intensive, and, and the analogy that he gave is imagine if physicians went through medical school and weren't taught about, say, the liver or the heart, you know, and, and, and they would have to relearn medicine in a sense, like the microbiome. That's how important all the different uh, metabolic, nutritional, immunologic functions, and as you just talked about, behavior as well, which is really important. So we're really excited, you know, to learn from you about ways where we can improve bacterial diversity, improve the health of the microbiome. Um, and I love your approach, and, and we're going to get into the details, but if you could talk to us, just give us a big picture overview about how it's not just about diet. You know, the microbiome is huge, but it's how you live your life that really impacts the health of your microbiome, is it not? Yes. So we've, like I was kind of mentioning, we've become this sterile world that thinks that germs are the enemy, but we're shifting now and understanding that it's not all germs. So antibacterial soaps, uh, antibacterial gels, not so great because they are messing with your microbiome. And if you want to maintain a diverse microbiome, it's, it's the same type of advice that we hear over and over, which is 
eat a diet that's varied in all different types of vegetables. You're getting different types of carbohydrates, which is what the microbiome uses to create short chain fatty acids, which are anti-inflammatory and he healthy for the gut lining like butyrate. And, uh, but then the other thing is get dirty, like get out in nature. And in some respects, without putting yourself in danger, like maybe even eat a little bit of dirt. Like uh, don't, uh, like if you're able to, you know, and this is, I would say only if you know where the plants are coming from, because obviously if you're buying mass produced lettuce that could have been downstream from. Glyphosate. Uh, yeah. From, yeah. Yeah, so, or from where they're factory raising cows and there's resistant E. coli that gets into the soil, then you, know, you don't want to get an E. coli 0157 infection. But in a sense, if you know that your produce is organic and it's come from a clean source, a little bit of dirt in the lettuce may not be a bad thing for us. And I say that because I have some patients that I actually put on a soil-based probiotic. When we've gotten to a certain point where they're doing much better, but there's still something kind of missing. And I'll, almost every time I add the soil-based probiotic, they feel way better. Mm -hmm. So it says something about, you know, we don't completely understand all of the bacteria that make up our gut flora. But we know that doing things like this or having pets, if you're not allergic, like I have a dog and I call him my microbiome reconstitution assistant mm -hmm. uh, because he licks my face, he licks my hands all the time and he's spreading his microbiome on us, but that keeps our microbiome varied and, and uh, diverse. diverse, yeah. It's really amazing. Um, but most, a lot of parents, if their dog were to lick a child, or this happens with family and stuff, we have two pets as well, and we kiss them and, and do all that sort of stuff. But um, I've noticed interactions how some parents, like, they don't like that. If your pet licks their child, they're like, get the soap out, this is People, Yeah, and that's this society we've become kind of yeah. germaphobic but if you look at people that grew up and were raised in a farm, uh, a lot of times they have less cases of allergies than someone who grew up in the city and was using antibacterial soaps. And that's the whole germ theory now is that are we becoming too clean? And is that part of the reason that our immune system is actually breaking down because it's not encountering all the different bugs that it needs to encounter in order to create tolerance? So then we're seeing this big surge in autoimmune disease. And it's not just here in the US, it's worldwide as the world changes. You know, even in India, there's a rise in autoimmune disease. And we know India has a lot of exotic bugs and parasites and things. And India actually used to have the lowest rates of autoimmune disease in the world. And that's shifting now as they become more westernized. So we have to think about these things and think about, you know, what are the general recommendations for healthy living? And one of them is, you know, get a little dirty. Yeah. You know, take your shoes off, walk on the, on the earth, on, um, you know, get out in nature. And possibly eat a little dirt um, if you know where your food is coming from, which, yeah. is, which is really unique. Yeah, um, having experimented a little bit with gardening myself, I found that to be pretty fun. Um, I know it's not for everyone because like if you get a little a little rock, you know, and you're eating a salad or something like that, people get a little freaked out. But it's nice to uh, to hear these ideas and we're, we're kind of evolving the conversation from low glycemic, low calorie, low fat to, okay, forget the macro and micronutrients for a little bit. Let's focus on what all this... And, the, and, and this is even bigger because if you think about just uh, in, in the exhibit yesterday, I think they said in just... There could be a billion organisms in just one tablespoon of soil. You know, so we think of the microbiome that exists inside us, but there are microbiomes everywhere, including the soil. So when you raise crop and you spray something like glyphosate on it, which is a chelating agent, so it chelates minerals, not only is it starving weeds, and it's killing weeds, it's actually killing the microbiome in the soil. And it's changing the diversity of the microbiome in the soil, which we need to bind nitrogen and make it into food that the plants use. So it's creating, and it even ties into the environment 
and greenhouse gases. Uh, this is something I, I learned yesterday that the majority of the oxygen that's made, like 50% of the oxygen in the earth comes from small organisms like uh, green algae and phytoplankton in the ocean and even cyanob cyanobacteria. Mm. So, which is crazy, you know, yeah, that these tiny organisms are providing the sustenance by which we live. And we're destroying them daily. Yeah. Yeah, it's pretty scary. So yeah, th this con th you know this conversation is not only improving the health of humans, but also the planet. Yes. It's just really, really powerful stuff. Um, so let's talk about the CARE program and kind of what that is. And, and I love the cleansing beyond just like detoxing and, you know, bowel evacuation and, and things. Like I think people, when they hear the word detox, they think they're going to be in the bathroom all day and, and having flushes and all that. But you go again a much bigger picture kind of the, the 57,000 foot view yeah my 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 approach is a 360 degree um, approach to health and the gut care which I, I loved coming up with that acronym because one it's about caring for self but then each word means something so the first the C is cleanse but it's not just about cleansing your diet, maybe cleansing uh, yourself of foods that are highly antigenic, that are causing an immune reaction, uh, maybe cleansing yourself of sugar, you're eating too much sugar, uh, but it's also cleansing uh, your kitchen, thinking about the, f the, the water that you drink, uh, thinking about the environment that you live in, so maybe even having um, an activated carbon filter, HEPA filter, to keep your air, indoor air clean. And it's also about cleansing the mind of negative thoughts. So my, my viewpoint in creating this program for the gut is that it's not just about the diet, it's not just about, you know, perhaps some supplements that can help, it's much more global if you want to have a happy gut that creates total body wellness you have to approach your your health from this much wider point of view that it has a lot to do with lifestyle and you have to educate yourself about the types of pots that you use to cook your food and whether they have chemicals that might be harmful to you that are getting transferred to the food and then you're eating that because if you're eating a healthy diet and yet you're making it on toxic materials then what's what the what's the point mm -hmm. so that's why when i started writing the book and i felt this section was so important that cleanse is so much broader than just saying okay this is my diet prescription this is the way you should eat if I just did that, I would feel like I did not do my job. So I felt that I had to tell people and inform them that you have to cleanse your kitchen. You know, you have to think about where your water comes from or what type of filtering device you're using to maybe take heavy metals out of the water. You know, we've had cases where there's been lead in pipes and people have had lead toxicity. This happened in Washington, D.C and women were having an increased rate of spontaneous abortion and they couldn't figure out and they found that there was actually lead seeping from the pipes. So, you know, we live in this toxic world, so you have to think about that if you want to be healthy, you have to analyze, well, what are all the aspects in your life where you can bring in health? Another big one for me is because I, my approach is mind, body, spirit, is really thinking about, you know, the mind and cleansing the mind of negative thoughts. And one of the tools I tell my patients all the time is the, the strongest way to cleanse your mind of negative thoughts is to find what you're grateful for. Because in that moment that you're expressing a gratitude, there is no space for negativity. When you, when you focus on gratitude, uh, all the negativity fades. You, you cannot be both at the same time. You can only be one. And if you bring in more gratitude into your life, then little by little, you start shifting the way your mind works. And you shift from the negative that might be a running reel in the background to being able to always find the positive. Because every day there's 
two aspects. You know, you might have had, like you had your luggage lost on the way over and, you know, that could be a negative moment. But, you know, the positive side is you got here in one piece, you're safe, uh, your luggage will be found at some point. It's not the end of the world. You know, so you can't let that become the defining factor in your experience of life because then you're just letting negativity rule you. So, but always finding gratitude, which is a part of my program, is expressing a daily gratitude. And I find that that is such a powerful, powerful thing to do. And even I, I mean, it, I have to practice this. And some days I forget, uh, but my new thing now is every day at the end of the day, uh, thinking about the things that I'm grateful for. And then at the beginning of the day, starting with some yoga and meditation and then setting my intention for the day. Like, what is it that I want out of this new day that's coming? Is it uh, new knowledge or, you know, sometimes my intention is just uh, to be centered and guided so that I can be a source of wisdom for my patients. Right, kind of more intuitive and pick up on small cues. Yeah. Yeah. Then everybody's intention can be different but I feel like if you set the tone that's so powerful, what it does to your system by actually bringing that in uh, and creating that intention for the beginning of the day. So that's why part of the gut care program is starting the day with a meditation, even if it's just five minutes, just to kind of center yourself into your day. That's amazing. And that's what I wanted to bring up from the book is, and, and this is a natural, you've already been describing it, but just want to reinforce, you talk about the physical gut in the book, but before that is the emotional gut. And, and so let's kind of bring this conversation about gratitude, spirituality, back to gut health so that people realize like, you know, I've heard meditation is good, but I haven't taken that next step to actually do something about it. Like talk to us about how the gut brain connects to, to the GI tract and the microbes and all that. So what we're seeing, and I talked a little bit about is how the research a disturbed gut microbiome can actually affect the way that you think or even your anxiety levels. Yeah. You know, obviously it's much more complex than just that. And you cannot, um, you can't be completely reductionistic about it, but even in a, a mouse model of autism, they found if they shifted the gut flora that they could improve the behavior of the mouse. And we know that a lot of children with autism have disturbed gut flora. That's one uh, common finding across the board. So there is some connection there and I think we're learning a lot of this. I think we're just in the infancy of the potential that we're going to arrive to and, and maybe eventually having, like I said, probiotics that have been designed to treat certain conditions. For example, like we find that a probiotic supplement can help with depression. Which is fascinating. Yeah. But I always, you, even though that's fascinating, I think that has to be put into the setting of a non-reductionistic approach to health, which says, okay, then I will take a probiotic as part of my treatment for depression, but I'm also going to do introspective, maybe talk therapy, and I'm gonna get out and exercise because that's been proven to help reverse depression. I'm gonna do all these things. So it's not about the one magic thing, it's about how all of these tools can work together to give you the most optimal health you can achieve. That's really fascinating stuff. A lot of details to pull away from, but I want to go back to a story that you told me. You're on a meditation retreat, and you were focusing on an area of your abdomen and you notice some heat. Now, if you can get into the detail there, I think it's pretty powerful because that just shows where you where you focus on expands in a sense, particularly yeah. in the gut and, and why, that, why that can help people with Crohn's, colitis, you know, constipation, diarrhea, to bring that energy there. Yeah, or even, so a lot of people with gut issues might actually have energy blocks in this region. And for a lot of people, the gut can you know it's our digestion and assimilation so it's the way we take in the world uh, but it can also represent holding back and this is not based on any science on my part it, it's just based on empiric observation that maybe sometimes the person who has a gut issue 
there's certain aspects or places in their life where they hold back or they feel that there is some sort of power struggle with someone else. It could be a boss, it could be a family member, and there are things that have not been said there. So um, when I do this meditation, which goes back to my background as a yoga instructor and learning uh, meditation from them, but also learning about the chakras, the energy centers in the body. Um, but this is common not just to uh, yogi philosophy, but also is the Dan Tian, which is recognized in Japanese uh, martial arts you know, as the power center right here, one inch below the navel. And uh, one meditation that I do is to expand that center because that's kind of the foundation for the rest of the energy that moves through the chakras. And basically we were talking about that, like what do you do with the monkey brain? And one thing you can do is just kind of uh, create an intense place of focus. So you can either meditate with your eyes closed, which is the way I, I usually do, or you can sit in a room and have an object kind of far away that you can focus on and you keep your eyes soft but open and you just focus all your attention there. Uh, but as part of that exercise, you don't judge the object. You remove all judgment. And you'll find that you'll start judging it. You'll think like, well, it's small. Oh, I don't really like that color, the red, or whatever, uh, your mind is judging. Same thing here, um, I'll put my hands on that spot and I'll just start focusing on it and I find that if I put all my attention there while breathing that it actually starts to get warm and if I do it for long enough it can get really really hot. Um, and I've had similar experience recently with my hands uh, getting really really hot during a meditation. And I think that's just because I've done it for so many years that um, I don't know that, you know, I, I'm more experienced with it. There are people who are way better than it, on it than I am. And there are a lot of people who get discouraged because they feel like their mind is too wandering and they can't settle it down. But like any other thing, the brain is a muscle like anything else. So I tell my patients, um, you th if you never ran, do you think you can run a marathon tomorrow? So if you've never meditated, why do you think you should be meditating perfectly by tomorrow? Right. You have to train your mind. And it takes removing the judgment, having compassion for self, and forgiving yourself for not doing it perfectly. And you have to analyze what are those aspects that are coming in in your experience of meditation and the way you might judge the fact that you can't settle your mind and you, your thoughts are, are wondering, are, uh, you know, fleeting. And where does that come into play in your life? Because it can be a big teacher. It's not just about, you're not just doing it when you're meditating, you're doing it all throughout your day. That's my biggest tip, I'll say, from having the conversations, many that we've had prior to recording, was the monkey brain and not and removing judgment of that. And I think that's a big hindrance. You know, like we talked about, a lot of people feel like, I'm, I suck at meditation. I just think about, like you said, buying groceries, walking the dog, planting plants, you know, all that homework, whatever it may be. But that's part of the process, is it not? It's part of the process and for some people you have to think just like there's there's not one size fits all. You have to find which style of meditation works for you. And for me, because I've used so many different styles, except I've never done transcendental, uh, but depending on my mood and my state of being, I may use one style versus another. So I may sit down and just feel like watching my breath. Or I might do something where I'm focused, like a loving compassion meditation that I learned at the Tibet house, uh, which is a heart-centered meditation uh, where you just expand your compassion to people that you love, to the people in your city, to the people in your country, and then to the entire world. 
and that's just another way to focus your mind. Or I might use guided imagery and it could be that I go to a place where I feel really at peace and I've created my own private oasis where I go to where it's just a place of calm for me and I feel safe and protected there. And anyone can create that. It's actually kind of nice to just, you know, because maybe you can't afford to buy a house, but guess what? You can build your dream home right in your head. And it can be in whatever location you want it to be. It could be right by the seashore and you're listening to the waves crashing on the seashore. Or it could be by a river and you're listening to the river run. And that can be the place that you go to for peace and equanimity. And that, can, that in itself can be a meditation. So it doesn't all have to be that you're clearing your mind. It can be just that you're, you're taking yourself on a very focused journey. And you can get the same benefits from it doing that or like using a biofeedback device like heart math that we talked about so some people will do really well with biofeedback if they find that they have a lot of difficulty getting into that meditative state yeah that's really amazing and like we talked about earlier so the monkey brain all those you know that voice that's saying you have to do this do that do that you're not good at this that becomes quieted when you focus on the safe place too so it serves a a dual purpose in the sense it helps you get there but also shuts down kind of the monkey brain but let's talk about the utility of it so you're driving in manhattan you're late for an appointment do you go into this safe place um to help calm down that sympathetic nervous system response like when would someone use that Anna? if you train yourself uh you can go there in an instant so you're stressed you're having a bad day uh your boss uh, came down on you hard you can, boom, go there and be back here in an instant. Yeah. And you can still be present with everyone else around you, uh, but you can train yourself to be able to access that place. Because you, if you've meditated and you've spent time there, then that place has become that for you. That place that accentuates your parasympathetic and calms down your sympathetic nervous system. So it's a tool. Yeah. So again, for folks listening, why, like, why are they spending so much time talking about spirituality and meditation? This all ties into gut health and the microbiome. And, and some other tips I learned from your book was the breathing exercises. You have four different ones, I believe, and also yoga poses. So I work together with my two yoga teachers that I really admire. Uh, Paula Tursi, who is known worldwide uh, for this uh, organ-centered yoga where you're moving from your internal organs. So that's why I teamed up with her because I thought she was perfect for helping design the yoga poses for the gut. So there's one yoga pose for each day of the week and each pose has certain benefits for different effects that it can have on the nervous system as well as on the digestive system and digestive health. And the other yoga teacher is Janet Daly Butler, and she's an expert on mantras and chanting, and also um, she helped, uh, along with Paula, come up with certain breathing exercises that are meant to not just benefit digestion, but also benefit the entire body as a whole. So we have very specific instructions on how to do these, and uh, you can kind of pick and choose depending on what you're experiencing or even you know just try each of them separately and see which one uh, yeah which one uh, speaks true to you so there's one called the long deep breath and even though I may not sit down and do it in a formal fashion sometimes I was telling you in between patients if I need a reset so I need to recenter myself um, I'll do three big, really deep breaths as I clear my mind so then I can be present and ready for the next patient. So a question came to mind, and don't mean to interrupt you, but are we talking yeah. 30 seconds, 15 seconds? Like, oh, how, long, how long is the breath? So it could be an inhale for 10 seconds and then a slow exhale for another 10 seconds, and then you just repeat. And if you're having a really stressful moment in the middle of the day, if you just stop and do that, and even if you work in an open office, your workmates might not know what you're doing. 
uh, you can do it in silence, but it resets your body. And in that moment, you clear your mind so you can go back to what you were doing, you know, and it's kind of sort of like this tuning into the rhythm of the body, which I think we've gotten really disconnected from. Uh, there was a study I read that was quite interesting, and I don't know how they were able to uh, measure this, but they found that people who have disturbed circadian rhythms that, or also people who do not eat on a regular uh, schedule, so maybe one day you eat lunch at 12, the next day you can't eat lunch till 3, then the next day you're eating at 1, then the next day you don't eat lunch till 4, that doing that to your gut microbiome creates a shift in the microbiome that promotes metabolic syndrome and weight gain. Mm. Wow. And that was really fascinating because I always knew that one of the causes of weight gain is a disturbance in the circadian rhythm. People that don't sleep enough, that are eating at odd hours, uh, and then to see that it actually has a direct connection to our microbiome. It's really fascinating research. Yeah, that is, and, and that moreover, and that, that new, those nutrients kind of entrain the circadian clock and kind of... Yes, affect. and cert, there's certain bacteria that are almost, they're expecting to be fed at a certain time of day. Wow, big time. Yeah, so many things to, to break away here. I think people are getting a lot of practical uh, tips here. But uh, back to what you were saying about in meditating in the office. You know, I meditated. Uh, Sam and I had a late uh, plane ride to get here to do this interview and other interviews. And it was meditating on the plane, and, and both people next to me were asking what I was doing, and, and they saw the Muse device. So, you know, being healthy is not like, there's not a stigma linked with it now. People realize that, yeah, health is in, it's the way that we're going. So, yeah. um, I would not want people to be discouraged, like, oh my gosh, are they looking at my breath? Or what are they, you know, do they think I'm weird? People are going to ask you questions and most likely want to learn more about it, you know, which is pretty interesting stuff. So... This yeah. is, I love where this conversation is going. Let's go back to the home a little bit. That's a big source of toxins, like you mentioned. So Teflon uh, pans, you know, how does that affect the gut? How are indoor air pollutants, like maybe some of the top hit rate things, I know that you go into great detail in, in Happy Gut. Yeah, so for example, like nonstick surfaces on cookware have uh, flame retardants. And so when you cook your food on that, it it will pick up some of this. You may not see it, but over time you will see it as you see that the bottom of the pan starts to wear away and you see that it's disappearing. Well, where do you think it went? It went into your food and then you ate it and it went into your body. So a lot of these chemicals are fat soluble, so they accumulate in the fat. And so part of the theory is that as you accumulate these fats, um, fat soluble, chemicals that they make you gain weight because part of the body's pr protective mechanism is to pocket all of this in your fat to keep it out of the circulation. That's why detoxing and cleansing is so important when someone is in a weight loss program because what happens as you start uh, melting away the fat is that you can put a lot of these chemicals back into the circulation. So you have to be detoxing as you're losing weight or what will happen is the the chemicals will stay in your circulation and then your body will once again once you're off the diet start pocketing it back into the fat to protect you from these chemicals so things like the non-stick wear those are like big ones uh, both in utensils so I personally like using ceramic enameled uh, pots or a lot of stainless steel. That's what I'll use for cooking. And same thing for cooking utensils, either bamboo or stainless steel. Those are like my, my biggest ones. Yeah. But people don't want to clean stainless steel, you know, and it can be hard like with eggs. So do you use butter or coconut oil? Have you played around with different oils? Yeah, so like if I'm, I, I love making a sunny side egg and I'll use coconut oil as the base and I coat the, the bottom of the pan with that. And if you cook it at the right heat for, you know, you have to be careful if you put the heat on too high, you're going to overcook it and then it's gonna stick to the bottom. If you do it just at the right medium heat, 
then it's going to cook just right and it'll just come off. So it's easy. And I also use another uh, cookware which is called 360. And that one, what it does is it creates a vapor seal. So you can steam vegetables using less water. And once, once the water is boiling, you actually put the heat down and you cook it at lower heat. But it creates a vapor seal where all the, the vapor stays inside the pot. So you get nicely steamed vegetables with less water and you're not losing nutrients into the water. So a lot of times what happens is you might use too much water. And then if you're throwing out the water, a lot of the nutrients are thrown out there. And that's something I remember from my childhood because my great aunt was a nutritionist who had studied in the US and then became the head of nutrition for the schools in Cuba. And one story that my family always would tell me is that when they boiled the vegetables and they th threw out the water, she would tell them you just threw out all the nutrients. But the idea is, you know, you want to use enough water so that you can steam the vegetables uh, without uh, losing the nutrients into the water. You don't want to use too much water. So that's why I like this pot because it creates that vapor seal. Interesting. 360 yeah. it's called. 360 cookware. Yeah, and it's all, I love the company because it's all American made. They actually save jobs for all these people that were losing their jobs, uh, factory jobs in Michigan. Um, so I like their philosophy and they also use very um, much cleaner, uh, low toxin type of process to create the, the pots. Anybody who reads my book can get a discount on, on their cookware. So, you know, so part of it is choosing clean food. The other part is kind of really looking into what are you cooking your food on. And then we have to think about the water that we're drinking. You know, so like he, I live in New York City and if you just pour a, a glass of tap water, you can smell the chlorine in the water. And I understand they have to do that to keep all the pipes clean throughout the city, but that's not something you want to drink. So you don't want to ingest that chlorine, which is going to mess up with uh, your um, thyroid, for example, uh, because it will compete for binding sites with iodine. So you want to use some sort of water purification system. And I talk about different ones. You can use a reverse osmosis. But if your budget is lower, you can just get a carbon filter you know, to help. And there's different, there's different ones that I recommend uh, from different companies. There's some that are better than others. And if you go online and research, uh, you can see what percent of minerals each one takes out of the water. You know, so like if the water had chlorine, how much of it will be taken out by the filter. And these are things you have to consider. Right. Yeah, it's an everyday reality. What about in the shower? Do you have the, the shower filters and stuff? Same thing. Yeah. Uh, one thing I personally struggle with, and we haven't talked about this, but you know the, the utility of Epsom salt baths, but yet you have the shower filter, and if you don't have... So what would you do yeah, there? That's, that's a that's, tough one. That's a, that's a conundrum. I love recommending Epsom, Epsom salt baths right. to patients. Uh, I don't know. I don't know what to do. To we turn around that. really hot and use it, use it from the shower and you lose a lot in the steam. Yeah, exactly. And then top it off with a little bath water. But again, just, I mean, if you can minimize the total load in your home, maybe a little water here and there to get that magnesium, I don't know. Itself. I've seen, and I don't know how, how um, the utility of these, they're almost like, um, they're dissolving tablets that you can throw in the bath and they inactivate the chlorine. Interesting. But I have no, I have not researched the science behind that, so I can't vouch for it. I don't know how, but I thought it, when I saw it, I thought, well, this is fascinating. If you can just drop a tablet in your bathtub and it takes away the, the ill effects of the chlorine. Yeah, yeah, I think uh, Dr. Ben Lynch was working on something like that. I need to figure out the, the biology there. Um, one thing that comes to mind as we come to a close, and you talk about in this in the book, you mentioned like for overweight people that are losing weight, which you know about 71 plus percent of Americans are overweight or obese, 
So we want people to lose weight, but as they're losing weight, they're detoxing these fat soluble toxins. And you, you kind of just mentioned, you want them to detox at that same time. So is that specialized micronutrients, different foods? Like talk to us about that detoxification. So when the types of things that are gonna bind those types of toxins are fiber. Uh, so it can be like brown rice fiber, but also uh, chlorophyll. So like dark leafy greens, spinach. Uh, the other thing that is in my program, which increases the excretion of these toxins, is green tea. And so if you're combining green tea with uh, maybe making a smoothie in the morning where you put in some spinach, some uh, baby greens, uh, you know, you're creating a detoxification powerhouse and then have a green tea as your source of caffeine for the day instead of coffee. Yeah. And what's just anecdotally, what's so fascinating about the polyphenols, not only do they detox, but our gut microbes love them. Isn't yes. that pretty cool? Yes. Yeah, so what are your favorites? So there, I mean, there's blueberries, raspberries, pomegranate, green tea, like, again, you talk about it in the book, but for folks listening and tuning in right now. Yeah, the big ones in the program are the berries. So blueberries, raspberries, blackberries, um, green tea, like we said. Um, I try to stay away from uh, too many sweet fruit in the 28-day program, uh, but once you're past that, you can bring in some new things. I just recently had a salad where they put uh, pomegranate seeds. You know, they're kind of a little bit gooey, uh, but they added a nice element to a salad, so you can think about doing stuff like that where you're a creative and combine these nutrients together because it really you want to have the variety right. of the different uh, nutrients like the polyphenols along with the chlorophyll and everything else uh, to create a, a healthy gut microbiome. Yeah, that's fascinating. Um, two, two last questions. This comes up a lot and, and I think we've talked about this before, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. Talk about it in the book. But there's kind of two schools of camp when it comes to fiber. People eat as much fiber as you can because it fuels the microbiome. And then there's the SIBO camp that are really afraid of it. Where do you, what sort of conversations do you have with, with people that are really scared of fiber because it causes GI issues? I'm going to say in my practice, it will be a case by case basis, right? Um, because I do see a lot of people come in with SIBO or failed SIBO treatment from another doctor. Um, so you have to be careful not to give too much in terms of the types of foods that are going to fuel or, you know, help replicate the microbiome. Um, but at the same token, um, I find that for a lot of these patients, uh, sugar is a big issue. So, and you also have to think, you know, is it, is it the fiber in the diet? Is it fiber without enough water? You know, is it the mix of fiber? Is it, uh, you know, soluble versus insoluble? And whether maybe, because a lot of people eat too much sugar in all different forms. So it could come as uh, simple starches. And then is it really SIBO or is it yeast overgrowth that's causing the gassiness? And sometimes I, I find, or is it both? You know, maybe we have both and we have very limited means by which to diagnose uh, candida or yeast overgrowth. So a lot of times it's, it's sort of a diagnosis of exclusion or just based on clinical impression and the patient's symptoms. And I talk about that a little a bit lot. in the book. I and, and I also have a quiz that you can take that distinguishes whether you might have a yeast overgrowth or not, depending on your score. Uh, but that's, that's the thing. So it's going to be a case-by-case -case basis, but in a general recommendation, we know we eat too little fiber. Men should be getting at least 35 grams per day and women at least 25 grams per day, but most Americans eat somewhere between 10 and 15 grams a day of fiber. And that's what's going to create a healthy gut flora, which is anti-inflammatory and also helps prevent colon cancer. Yeah, it's really big. Uh, we caught up with Jeff Leach on episode number 110 or something along those lines, and, and he said that even little kids in Tanzania, 
um, uh, rural, you know, folks, they were eating like a hundred grams of fiber a day. And so oh, yeah. it's like this belly that you see in pictures of, you know, indigenous peoples is, is really from the fiber and the fermentation. It's not always quashir or, or protein deficiency. Um, yeah, that's astounding to me. If you look at uh, ancient cultures or more uh, primitive cultures, they're eating closer to a hundred grams of fiber per day. And just think we're on the other side of that spectrum, yeah. not, not eating enough fiber. Right. You know, and, and what that does to our gut microbiome, because it, it shifts it. And they actually, that was the other thing uh, I'm sh to mention is that these col indigenous cultures that are eating so much more fiber have a much more diverse microbiome than uh, people that are eating you know, the standard Western diet. Right, and that's why I wanted to bring up the question because you have people with overt GI issues and a lot of practitioners are saying avoid fiber, go FODMAPs and, and stuff like that. And I understand that and I know clinically it works, but, but also, I mean, is there a threshold where we can restore the diversity to such a point that having fiber is more beneficial than detrimental? And so it's, it's a great conversation. I, o I always see those programs as a transition program to eventually eating the varied diet that everyone should be eating. So it's, it's a tool for a new Western disease, in this case called SIBO, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. Um, but I th my, my whole philosophy is to get the person through that and eventually expand their diet while keeping a lot of really good habits you know bringing in a lot of vegetables into the diet and trying to not make the junk the central feature of the diet or too many refined uh, starches carbohydrates yeah i like how you talked about that it's a transition and it does help you know like like you mentioned so the book comes out the 29th of december you said you had a quiz let's talk about the happy gut you know the website and the resources so if people want to learn a little bit more about that where can they go they can go check out happygutlife.com and you can learn about the book there. Uh, you can see testimonials from patients that have done the program. You can learn about the cleanse and it's going to be a place that I'm going to constantly be updating with recipes, with blog posts, all centered around gut wellness but also how gut wellness is connected to total body wellness. Mm -hmm. So I hope to make it a resource for people that uh, they will want to come back over and over and learn more about the gut and the microbiome and um, keep uh, uh, things interesting and recipes also, because yeah, I think everybody, so everybody loves a recipe and I already have a few recipes up, but we have a whole bunch uh, coming. I think we'll be releasing one new recipe every month. Awesome. Fantastic. You have a lot of recipes and, and meal options in here as well, yeah. shopping lists, and there's so much more that we could talk about that we just didn't have time for. But uh, really appreciate you coming on the show. I want to commend you for all the work that you're doing, Dr. Pedre, so keep it up. Well, I hope you found that informative. I know I did. Learned a ton from Dr. Pedre. He's got great energy, and what's really unique is he practices what he preaches, which I always love, and, and so that's what we're trying to do here. So uh, appreciate you tuning in, and appreciate you sharing uh, the show with friends and family that may benefit from this, and also your reviews. Your reviews help me uh, give feedback, help our speakers, uh, and help expose the show to more individuals. So thanks for writing those uh, excellent re reviews and subscribing. Again, you can access the show notes in the transcript by going to highintensityhealth.com slash drpedre. So with that, I'm going to tune out, but really appreciate you coming on and hope you have a fabulous day and we'll catch you on the next episode.